Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to uh, chair this last session of uh, what I think was an extremely rich and uh, fruitful uh, colloquium. And I think all, I can speak for both the organizers, who I also both thank for the good uh, cooperation and, and all the staff, and also the staff at the Fitzpower <coughs> Institute uh, for working so nice together. I think we, we, we learned a lot for our project. And uh, this now, the, the last session, uh, will in a way bring us um, to the sources or to part of the sources that uh, we plan to, uh, the, the investigators plan to work with. Uh, the, um, if I may call both of you kind of oral history sources, I hope you will forgive me for this uh, 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 very strange uh, way of uh, addressing someone like Professor Voskamp or Jürgen Kocka, and, uh, but um, they can handle it. Um, so I, I also thought because of this that they, they hopefully will bring in a, a lot of insight, not just um, in, in an, an analytic framework, but also in terms of really facts and figures and, and things that only they remember that, of course, we will carefully check against the sources, as you <laughs> both know, um, and we'll, we'll see, you know, yeah. how we have already discussed yeah. it. Um, but uh, I think th that's why I feel that both of you deserve a good 20 minutes uh, uh, of time, because I think it, it, will, it will be good and important for us to, to have those uh, two uh, papers. I, I briefly um, uh, will kind of introduce uh, what is actually not necessary. First, uh, Professor Jürgen Kocka, uh, he taught uh, social history at the University of Bielefeld, where actually even I had the privilege to once uh, hear you, but you of course can't rem remember it because there were hundreds in the audience. Uh, and then he was uh, teaching at the Fuhr University in Berlin, uh, and uh, later on, he became a permanent fellow of the Berlin Institute of Advanced Study, the famous Wissenschaftskolleg, and president of the Social Science Center Berlin, WZB, uh, next to the Staatsbibliothek. Uh, he is a permanent fellow of the Center Work and Life Course in Global Historical Perspective at the Humboldt University. Uh, he has published widely in uh, modern German and modern general history, particularly in social, economic, and cultural history of Germany and Europe, as well as comparative history from the 18th century to the 21st. Um, he's, re he's received many honorary degrees from uh, several European universities and distinguished prizes as well. Uh, I just mention uh, some recent English publications of yours. Uh, Jürgen, uh, Industrial Culture and Bourgeois Society, Business, Labor and Bureaucracy in Modern Germany, came out in 1999, Civil Society and Dictatorship in Modern German History, 2010, and finally, Capitalism, A Short History, uh, 2015. Um, maybe as one more background information, uh, Jürgen Kocka was a guest professor here at the Hebrew University and he was on the board of the Minerva uh, Köbner Center also here. Uh, and, and you will you will say much more about it because uh, your paper is also already has in the title uh, personal recollections of the 1980s. So we will, uh, I, I'm not saying more about it. Um, I would uh, like to further welcome and uh, introduce Professor Wilhelm Voskamp. Um, he will speak in German, and uh, we, we, I think we, we, we left this open, so um, uh, I think, you know, everyone will be able to follow, uh, and uh, that's no problem. Uh, I think also Andreas uh, gave his <laughs> paper in German. Uh, he um, has been a professor uh, of uh, German and comparative literature at the University of Cologne. Uh, before, he was also a professor at the University of Bielefeld uh, in the 70s until the 80s. Then he became the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, the CIF, uh, 
also in Bielefeld uh, since 1987. He was professor at the University of Cologne, uh, which I've already mentioned, and from 1999 to 2004, the director of the Center for Cultural Studies, Media, and Cultural Communication. <coughs> Uh, since 1994. He's as well a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science. Uh, he has been a professor and a fellow in many, many countries in the US, in France, in the Netherlands, Brazil, Switzerland, and Japan. But the, the only one of key interest to us is, of course, <laughs> Israel today. Um, uh, he has been on the advisory board of the Rosenzweig Research Center in 1989 to 1999, so actually the period where uh, some of us here were fellows there, uh, and so the other side, so uh, we are of course extremely curious to learn uh, kind of the real history behind it. His recent publications uh, that I would like to mention before I hand over, Der Roman des Lebens, Die Aktualität der Bildung und ihre Geschichte im Bildungsroman, Berlin 2009, and then he edited Theorie der Klassik, uh, 2009, as well as Möglichkeitsdenken, Utopie und Dystopie in der Gegenwart uh, in Munich 2013. Um, uh, I think we follow uh, uh, the program, so uh, over to you, Jürgen Kocker. Thank you very much. Please, yes. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation and to you, Raphael, for introducing me as an oral history source. Uh, that uh, is exactly the case, and I feel that I'm really giving a kind of pedestrian uh, approach after all these excellently researched uh, papers we have heard uh, yesterday and uh, before. I'm want to relate how I got into contact with some Israeli historians um, without being a student of uh, uh, Israeli-German relations, and nor am I a specialist for Jewish history. I want to reflect on institutional, intellectual, and other contextual conditions which uh, seem to have made such encounters uh, possible or likely. And I might add a remark on what these contexts have meant to me over time. While I try to emphasize experiences which I think have been shared by others, I will limit myself to my own experiences, contexts, and observations. I have not done systematic uh, research on the uh, uh, topic, uh, but I'm glad that this is on the way. I had studied in Germany in the 1960s and done postdoctoral research, uh, partly in the United States. And I got my first job as a professor in Bielefeld in 1973 in the newly founded uh, University of Bielefeld. My first intensive meeting with Israeli scholars occurred in the mid-1970s on a conference which Werner Jochmann, who has been mentioned this morning, the Hamburg historian who headed the Forschungsstelle für die Geschichte des Nationalsozialismus in Hamburg, when he organized a conference um, for a relatively small focus group um, of German and other, especially Israeli historians, um, who planned or already did research on topics of the social, economic, and cultural history of Jews in Germany in the 19th and 20th century. This was, by the way, the first time I met Shula Volkov, who can't be here, of whom I had read, however, and uh, heard already before, since both of us were deeply influenced by and uh, full of praise for Hans Rosenberg, with whom Shula had gotten her PhD in Berkeley and uh, while I had been lucky to meet him uh, several times since 1965 when I visited him in Berkeley and he invited me to his home. 
you know that Hans Rosenberg has become something like a founding father and a iconic figure for the development of social history in Germany, in West Germany. I remember also other participants, Chaim Schatzke, Avram Barkay, Marion Kaplan, Werner Mosse. We talked, that was the purpose, about methodological problems and common research concerns. Um, uh, and I had been invited because Jochmann thought the group should know about this newly developing kind of social history, history of society, Gesellschaftsgeschichte, historische Sozialwissenschafts, which we tried out in Bielefeld. <coughs> And I think initiatives like that one by Jochmann, um, uh, related initiatives were taking place in the early 70s at the latest uh, in other German universities. These were initiatives which made it um, meaningful, interesting, and likely to seek contact with Israeli historians of whom one knew that they would uh, be working on similar or related topics. In, the in this case, it was Werner Jochmann, a remarkable man, as we heard, disciple of uh, Fritz uh, Fischer, who took this initiative, partly together with, by the way, partly in tension with uh, Peter Freimark, uh, who then headed the Hamburg Institute, das Hamburger Institut für die Geschichte der deutschen Juden, which had been founded in Hamburg by the city of Hamburg in 1966. So there were research-driven motives for such cooperation. And previously shared research experiences did play a role. And I mentioned that already, especially experiences in the United States where several of us had been influenced uh, in different ways, frequently by emigre scholars like Hans Rosenberg and by others. So international connections in some way hope frequently preceded these initiatives towards German-Israeli uh, cooperation. The meeting was part of a loosely knit focus group on German Jewish history financially and organizationally supported by the German research organization Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, DFG. In the early 1970s, as we have learned today uh, and in uh, conversations, particularly in 1973, the DFG, uh, like other research institutions, had decided to get more intensive, um, more to get more intensively engaged in supporting cooperation between German and Israel, Germany and Israel, German and Israeli scholars, and not only in the natural sciences. According to its statutes, the DFG could directly finance only German. Uh, scientists. In order to finance focus groups and projects, uh, including foreign and, for instance, Israeli scholars, a specific scheme was invented and practiced since 1973, I believe, perhaps longer. Um, the projects had to be joint German-Israeli projects. The proposal had to come from the German partner and if approved, the grant would go to his or her institution, usually uh, university. The foreign partner, uh, usually in this case the Israeli partner, would act as a subcontractor and receive his or her share from the German institution. 600 to 800 of such bilateral uh, groups have been financed this way, I read and Jochmann organized one of them. Such bilateral um, projects frequently triggered intensive cooperation between German and Israeli or other researchers, in my case, a close cooperation with Werner Mosse, uh, 
uh, in Great Britain, in England, uh, developed and we later on engaged in studies uh, uh, on the Jewish-German uh, business uh, elite or economic elite. And other contexts which should follow, which should bring me to Israel in the following years now and then. These contexts help to explain to uh, partly at least why I received and uh, accepted the invitation to serve as a visiting professor at the Hebrew University uh, in 1985. Again, the institutional mechanism which brought me there may have been uh, most important. In this case, it was the Max Planck Gesellschaft um, whose close uh, relations uh, with Israeli scholars uh, uh, since the late 1950s we have heard about already a lot. As we know, they first had limited uh, the Max Planck uh, Gesellschaft through Minerva, limited uh, the cooperation to the natural sciences, particularly uh, to the Weizmann Institute, and I think it deserves closer study now. It deserves closer study how and why inside the Max Planck Gesellschaft in the course of the 1970s, I believe, um, the decision was reached to use some of the existing instruments, particularly the Minerva Gesellschaft, for supplying research, um, for supporting research also in the humanities which led to the, we heard it already, the founding of several Minerva centers since 1980, among them the Richard Köbner Minerva Center for German History at Hebrew University, with its chair for German history, which since 1980, and I was at his uh, speech of inauguration, was held by uh, George Mosse on a part-time basis. And in the uh, Max Planck in uh, Gesellschaft, uh, uh, the historian Rudolf Vierhaus, who correctly was stressed today uh, by Irene very much, played a decisive role in all of that. And he was also uh, decisive in finding mostly younger German uh, historians to serve as um, as um, adjunct visiting professors in a way, of always for a few months affiliated to this new chair which was held by George Mosse. And now uh, Hans Mommsen had been there, Reinhard Rürup had been there, Eberhard Kolb um, and others had held this position already and in the spring of 1985 it was my turn. These were intensive three months in which uh, Moshe Zimmermann took care of me very well. From We taught a course together and we played tennis together. And I had and developed contacts with uh, several Israeli colleagues. Um, uh, for instance, um, with uh, uh, Gabi Motzkin, from whom I learned a lot ever since, or with um, uh, Hetva Ben Israel, who is here today and who treated me very kindly, also with Stephen Ashheim and his wife uh, in these uh, years, and several others. Joshua Arieli was another partner of conversation, and we developed a close contact. We had many, um, we had some common experiences, both due to studies in the United States and due to the fact that we came originally from the sim similar part of northwestern Bohemia. <coughs> this, um, these contacts, of which I am very grateful also in retrospect, made this stay a productive and pleasant one for me. It was not selbstverständlich. In fact, I had been very nervous before coming. How would the teaching of mainly German history go with a group of Israeli uh, students? And would colleagues show much reservation? 
no time for no time for details now, but on the whole, it uh, was uh, uh, a much less difficult stay than I had expected. Surprisingly, undifficult stay, and productive and pleasant one. <clears throat> These close and productive contacts, both professional and personal, had immediate consequences in 1986-87. That was the year of the so-called Historikerstreit in Germany. I organized a research group on the history of the European bourgeoisie, Bürgertum, rather, in the 19th uh, century at the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies, CIF, in Bielefeld. Among the nearly 20 participants from different countries and different disciplines were three Israeli historians, Gabi Motzkin, Shula Volkov, and Moshe Zimmermann. Two of these three contributed to the chapter Die jüdische Minderheit in der bürgerlichen Gesellschaft. <coughs> um, and this group, all this small subfield, also profited from two other members of the research group, namely Steffi Jersch Wenzel and Egon Schwarz, the literary scholar from Washington University, St. Louis. <clears throat> of course, the 19th and early 20th century history of Jews in Germany, compared to the Jews in other uh, European countries, was a central topic within a research group, which was basically interested uh, to find out whether there was something like a German Sonderweg in the history of the Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, uh, which would then, in the crisis of the interwar period, lead to the collapse of German democracy and the victory of German fascism. <clears throat> this one-year working group, the results were already published in 1988, eight, contribute, contributed much to the further development and the modification, the critical modification of the received Sonderweg thesis. This was a process, close, usually in close cooperation between German, Israeli, and historians from other countries, particularly the United States. When I moved from Bielefeld to Berlin in 1988, I got into closer contact with two institutions which over the years had supported German-Israeli scholarly exchange quite a bit in history and in other um, fields, namely the Historische Kommission uh, zu Berlin and the Wissenschaftskolleg. Since 1978, the Historische Commission, a research in organization in West Berlin, a large one, uh, had had a Sektion für Deutsch-Jüdische Geschichte with a rather intensive guest program headed since 1978 by Steffi uh, Jersch Wenzel. She brought many Israeli scholars to Berlin and this continued after we had arrived. And the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin had been founded in 1981. Its founding charter, formulated and accepted by the Berlin legislature in 1978, identified as one of its, as one of its purposes to quote, die durch Nationalsozialismus, Holocaust und Krieg unterbrochenen Verbindungen zu wichtigen geistigen Strömungen wieder zu knüpfen, die teilweise bis heute in Deutschland unterbrochen sind. So, this idea to relate uh, practically and cognitively uh, to the catastrophic um, phase of German history and to its consequences, and in this, to the uh, prosecution and uh, uh, murder of the uh, Jews was part of this uh, program of this Wissenschaftskolleg. And indeed, in the first class of, of fellows in 1981-82, Gershom Scholem uh, 
was one of those who had accepted to come. Uh, and this received much uh, public uh, attention and it contributed heavily to the quickly growing repu international reputation of the Wissenschaftskolleg. He couldn't stay th all through all the year because he died. This was at the end of his life. And other many and over the next years other scholars from Israel came again and again and even a short history of the genesis of the German historical strife would have to mention the failed conversation between uh, Friedländer and Nolte. Uh, and this was in or around the Wissenschaftskolleg in 1985 or 86. So this was a type of uh, support for German-Israeli cooperation, also in history, in particular in history, which got much public attention, while the other ones which I mentioned were much more in the professional sphere. The permanent fellow Yehuda el Elkanah strongly contributed to this uh, development. But I'm not going to give further details about how my contacts with Israeli scholars continued under these new conditions. Um, rather, I want to close with uh, some more general um, reflections. Now I have to find the right part of my manuscript. I hope it's here. Well, first point, institutions and the decisions within the institutions had mattered a lot for what I had say, have said. They said uh, and these institutions and their decisions deserve to be more closely investigated. These uh, decisions uh, uh, were um, uh, partly, uh, do you know it's not the right? I apologize, but actually a lot of what I wanted to say, the two papers this morning already said, so I had to improvise a little bit. <laughs> I was very grateful, Irene, and to, to, to hear that, but it uh, a little bit disturbed my, my plans. Uh, <laughs> well, let me improvise that. Clearly, uh, institutions and money mattered. As I tried to show, in all these cases, institutional decisions uh, had been important. And uh, I see a basic change in the 1970s. Until then, uh, by and large, cooperation concentrated on cooperation between scientists and the uh, relationship between Minerva, Max Planck, and Weizmann Institute was central. And it was largely in the 1970s uh, that uh, 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 institutions like the DFD, but also like the Max Planck Gesellschaft, and certainly with support and under the influence of government decisions, uh, decided first to increase uh, uh, the support for cooperation between German and Israeli scholars and to diversify it, including more and more of the humanities and partly the social sciences. And uh, it, if one wants to explain these changes, first to describe them from the sources, which must be available, from the DFK, for instance, I suppose. In order to explain them, one has to certainly consider government influences. I think one has to ex uh, take into account the changing zeitgeist with respect uh, to the way in which this society dealt with its catastrophical past which has changed tremendously, of course, between the 1950s and the 1970s. And one also has to take into account uh, uh, changing priorities of scholars, because they had a say within the DFG and the Max Planck Gesellschaft and in other, in other places. So coming back to the initial question which Gabi Motzkin started to ask at the beginning of this conference, I think institutional decisions and funding has made a tremendous differences, difference 
and the contacts with Israeli scholars, which I partly described, and which have meant a lot for me in terms of enrichment and professionally and personally, probably would not have happened without these institutional decisions and these funds. But there were also movements towards cooperation uh, from bottom up, from the side of the scholars. And finally, largely scholars decided what to do with the funds. Now, I spoke about the 1970s, 80s, and I'm very much aware that the situation was different in the 1950s and 60s. This whole topic is uh, full of change, and when one needs to be specific about the period one is talking. <clears throat> I tried to show, and the papers by Irene Aue and Jonathan Shilo Dayan made abundantly clear this morning that there were many initiatives in favor of cooperation on the level of active scholars, researchers, professors, from Walter Grab and Joshua Arieli uh, to uh, Lepsius and Albrecht Schöne, to mention, not to mention those who were professors and uh, organizers of science uh, like uh, Fios, uh, for instance, or Tadden at that time, who was only rector of Göttingen University for a very short time, and he came in in the turmoils of the 1968 period as somebody relatively to the left who would get some student support without being regarded as impossible by the professorial majority much more a historian than an administrator, really. And I was very glad that this 1978 uh, book came out, which I lent out from the library for this purpose here, in order to speak about it a little bit too. But, yeah. OK. Um, by which motives were these activists driven? Very selective answer, only with respect to the German uh, side. Well, basically, it's part of the logic of scientific scholarly discourse to reach out, to talk to colleagues who deal with similar questions, to test one's own thesis in order to convince others or to revise oneself. One asks for approval and recognition beyond borders. So in a way, it's normal to talk to scholars of other countries. But of course, there is much more to the German-Israeli cooperation, and I want to close with two points. First, the first point relates to, my gen to the historians of my generation, my cohort, my network of historians. This was in the 70s and 80s, a diverse grouping of then young or uh, middle-aged historians who in the discipline and in public discourses uh, took a left of the center or left position in very, very different ways, criticizing traditions, demanding reforms, and advocating different variations of an histoire engagé. It was a grouping of historians whom the catastrophical developments of the German history between 1933, 1945, for whom this was a central reference point, a central reference phase, um, and we shared the attempt to account for this German, partly European, move from civilization to barbarism, um, and saw it as a main task on the agenda, either explicitly or much more often implicitly. So, <clears throat> yes, and Stephen uh, remarked this uh, already this morning. We usually did this from a liberal, from a democratic liberal, uh, left liberal, social democratic, sometimes socialist um, value base from which we developed very different variants of a critical assessment of German, partly European, sometimes all it transnational history. And uh, I would place, stop here, yeah. 
And this was, I see it, the major bridge between the grouping of historians to whom I see myself belonging on the one end and those Israeli historians with whom we uh, shared uh, experiences. A critical view towards German history, a high interest in accounting for the catastrophic mid 20th century and doing this from a relatively liberal point of view. Um, in addition, there were um, quasi existential dimensions which came up in this conference again and again. Uh, clearly, um, uh, uh, hope uh, us has history. Uh, it's a it's a complicated problem which we might take up in the discussion. I stay with the thesis which I stay, uh, mentioned yesterday that by and large. Uh, um, scholarly considerations, work and Wissenschaft uh, deal with the big questions of uh, guilt and destiny between uh, uh, happiness and religious mean meaning only indirectly. It's not the place for permanent confessions. We do it in an indirect way as scholars. On the other hand, uh, scholarly work of this sort is value related and uh, there is usually a close relation between strictly professional activities and non-professional activities. And it is in this field where the German Jewish context encounters have during my the decades I speak, spoke about had a quasi existential meaning as well. So these are the two points which I want stress with respect to the particularities of the German-Israeli encounters I experienced. Thank you.